Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices hosted by World Information Transfer and focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today, our presenter is Ambassador Otto von Weigenblatt, a distinguished academician and member of several royal academies in Spain and Mexico. He has extended educational background including a PhD and an EDD. He has been knighted by King Philip VI of Spain for his contributions to social sciences and leadership studies and has received over 10 doctorates, reflecting his interdisciplinary research in management, international development, and applied anthropology. Currently, he serves as Deputy Permanent Observer to the United Nations of the World Youth Association and was recently appointed as Advisor for Education at, with ambassadorial rank by the Secretary General of the Andrian Parliament. Over you, to you, Ambassador Feigenblatt. Thank you for the introduction and for the chance to uh, to talk about youth, about the future of the workplace, and about artificial intelligence. Uh, based on my background, which as you can see is interdisciplinary, I'm always interested about how youth is handling all of the changes that are coming about. And of course, one of those changes is how we deal in, with information. The value of information is changing, and what we do with that information is also changing. And at the core of this transformation, we have youth and we have artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence is not really new. Now, it's been with us for a long time. It's just that lately we hear about it a lot more in the media because of ChatGPT, BART, and other popular applications. But the idea of artificial intelligence comes from the 1950s and 1960s. You know, it really goes way back to the 20th century. That idea that computers, that machines could emulate human functions, special, especially human rationality. So it's not really new. Since the year 2000 and even the 1990s, there were already some very basic functions that somehow tried to copy human cognitive abilities. But at the same time, the word artificial intelligence bothers me as an anthropologist because it's not really exactly like human intelligence. It's something that is quite anthrop anthropomorphic in a way, uh, because artificial intelligence is a pseudocognition. Basically what it does is that it identifies patterns. In most cases, what we have are those like large databases. And what the computer does is just to find a pattern and combine it in a unique way. That some, sometimes it really looks like it's a human produced uh, answer, but it's not the same because human intelligence is more complex than that. And I will cite a very famous scholar here and that's Howard Gardner. Even though his theory of multiple intelligences has been criticized by some, there is no doubt that being a human, it's more complex than just having an intelligence quotient. We have we have arts, of course, we have emotional intelligence, for example, people talk about kinesthetic intelligence, uh, be, you know, like there are many theories about this. But the point is that being human is not only about the rational part of being human, but it's about the irrational part of being human. That's what makes human intelligence so unique. It's what leads to that creativity. At the same time, we cannot deny that artificial intelligence has advanced so much that it is making our life a lot easier in some ways. It kind of reminds me, as a former teacher, of the time when we introduced uh, calculators to the classroom. And for those of you who have my accumulated youth, you know, in my case, I'm from the 80s. I remember when I was in school, it was something that really terrified our teachers. Many people were saying that it's the end of the world for mathematics. You know, people will not learn mathematics anymore because they will be using a calculator. And before that, when they introduced, of course, like word processing is the same thing. People are going to forget how to write. 
Well, matter of fact is it's true that some people don't have the same calligraphy that they used to. Uh, cursive is becoming a rare uh, skill. And maybe off the top of our head, we don't have the same calculation abilities as previous generations, but it doesn't mean that we cannot do math. It doesn't mean that mathematics education ended or that people cannot write anymore. Well, the same issue is what we're being faced right now with artificial intelligence. It is a tool, but it also has limitations. And in order for you to harness and to prepare for all of the changes that are coming, not only to the workplace, but to education and to life in general because of artificial intelligence, we need to understand what it cannot do uh, and then focus on what it can do. And then think, how can we integrate artificial intelligence into our own lives, into our future uh, work plans, uh, for example? And artificial intelligence, there's still things that it cannot do. There is a debate as to what is the equivalent IQ, for example, of most of those artificial intelligence apps like ChatGPT uh, and BART and so on. And there is a disagreement. Some people say it's like from 114 IQ to 160. But there is agreement in that it cannot match the intuition and what they call crystallized intelligence of experts. And this is the part where it gets complicated because it depends on how we measure intelligence. But summarizing all of this, basically artificial intelligence is not at a point yet where it can do everything that a human can do. The creativity that we have as humans, even if they talk about generative AI, it's still not the same as, for example, a, ma a master artist or a composer. It's not at that stage yet. At this point, it's at the stage of emulation, identifying patterns, and recreating something based on a previous idea. Now, one question that I always get from professors and students and young people is, look, if we can just go to chat GPT or BARD and ask a question and why do it ourselves? Well, this is definitely a challenge in terms of how we view learning, how we view education and how we view information in general. Your generation, and we're talking about young people here, has access to more information than any generation before you. Think about the word Google, to Google, that which has become kind of like a verb. Now teachers and professors don't need to like memorize the facts because you can check immediately what is the altitude of the Himalayas, you know, what is the temperature in this place. So you have immediate access to facts. But going from a fact, going from data to information to knowledge, that has always been the challenge. And now we find ourselves in a moment where the question is more important than the answer. And this has always been the case, but even more so right now. Think about when you're trying to look up something in Google. You first need to figure out what you're looking for. If you don't know what the question is, then you can have access to all the information in the planet that is not going to do you any good. Now, in the olden days, let's say, the emphasis was on information. It was on facts. It was about learning the basic facts about the world. The teacher was supposed to be the sage upon the stage. But that doesn't matter anymore because you can access more information in the internet than any teacher can memorize, regardless of how many years of training they have. But at the same time, the teacher has something that Google doesn't have, that BART doesn't have, that ChatGPT doesn't have, and that is the ability to guide you to achieve the wisdom, to understand and to formulate the right questions at the proper time. Information changes. What is a fact today may not be a fact tomorrow. In other words, truth is situational. So young people today have the challenge that the world is changing faster than ever, that it appears simpler than before, but it's actually more complex. You know, it gives you a foul sense of comfort and certainty when you can look up any fact about the world. And at the same time, it's becoming even harder to come up with the questions for the proper problems in the world. 
So young people, we need to focus rather than on the ability to memorize facts on being able to identify the right questions at the right moment. How to do this? Well, the first thing is a change of attitude. And here I'm trying to go beyond just perfect rationality. You need to suspend judgment. You know, as humans, we hate uncertainty. That's the truth. We are creatures of habit. We like to do things the, the same way every day. And that gives us a feeling of safety, of certainty, a feeling that we control the universe. But we do not. And one thing that we learn the more you study, and I can tell you this from experience, is that the more you study, the more you realize that you have no idea about anything. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because sometimes knowing that you don't know and knowing what you don't know is more important than knowing what you know. And I know I'm probably losing you at this point of my talk, but think about it this way. Understanding that you don't know it's okay and suspending judgment so that you have enough time to take a pause, take a breath, and think about the question carefully can make all the difference in the world rather than jumping to try to find an answer automatically. Now, another change of attitude. We are used to being passive consumers of information and this is dangerous. You know, those years are gone when you used to sit in front of the TV, you had seven different TV channels and you used to switch and that's it. You just consume information passively. You have more choices than ever before in terms of the information that you consume. And you have more choices about how you consume it and what you use it for. But guess what? That requires energy. You have way more options than I did as a child in terms of TV channels. You have access to more information, but a lot of that information is going to be biased, is going to be irrelevant because in some cases, the information is neither good nor bad. You know, information is not going to kill you. It's just that it might be completely irrelevant for what you need in your life. And your time is going to be more valuable than ever. So you're going to have to decide what to do with your precious time, what questions to ask, what information to consume, and how to use it. And that takes energy. And it takes an open mind. Now, this is something that scientists are trained to do, if you think about it, which is to try to hold back on that urge to reach a conclusion immediately. The whole point is to keep the open mind, collect the data, analyze it, interpret it, triangulate. And then at the end of the day, you ask yourself, at least, do I know a little bit more than before? Or at least I know that my hypothesis, which is my guess, was wrong. Now, that was something that only scientists had to do for a long time, but now in general, young people need to have a different mindset. They need to have that judgment. They need to have that ability to withhold reaching and jumping to conclusions. Now, what else is changing? More teamwork. We are going to need more teamwork. There is a philosophical tradition, you know, that says that reality is intersubjective, you know, the idea that we construct reality together. And of course, you know, those philosophers of the early 20th century, they could never have imagined that now we live in a virtual world, that how interconnected our perceptions about our reality are. And now more than ever in your generation, because of social media and uh, simply the the density and intensity of interaction that you have with your peers, you are literally living in this intersubjective reality that is constructed by you, by the information you share and by the knowledge that you construct. construct. That gives you a lot of power. You have a lot of power to create your reality, but at the same time, it's also very dangerous because if you don't know, if you don't have principles and you don't know in what direction you want to take your reality, you're going to end up in a dystopia. So I know that this is very abstract, but basically young people nowadays, they don't know what's there in the future. Change happens at a faster rate than ever before. You have all of these tools that seem great, 
But at the same time, they also have the danger of making us helpless. And I'm going to come to this point before. You remember the analogy that I gave you with the time that they introduced calculators. Now, calculators are great, right? I mean, you don't have to, to spend so much mental energy remembering or doing everything in your head. But at the same time, the purpose of introducing calculators to the classroom was not just to make people lazy. It was not really exactly to make your life easier. The whole point was to free your mind, let's say your brain power, so that you could use that brain power to fulfill and to do more complex operations. That was the point. It was to scaffold you into things in, in order for you to reach your maximum potential so that you could solve more complex problems. And it's true. It, it managed to do that for many people, but for other people, it just made them lazy. Now, the same thing is happening with artificial intelligence. If we simply accept that BART, that chat GPT, that artificial intelligence is going to take over 70% of our mental functions, then we are not reaching higher. We're simply giving, giving up part of our humanity. And with the danger, and now we come to the part about the changing workplace, that according to most forecasts, we are going to have a huge transformation of the workplace. And by this, I mean that almost 30% of jobs will disappear. Now, they will disappear, they will reappear, but they will reappear very differently. So we're going to have a massive transformation of the workplace. We're going to have a shift in certain jobs into higher skilled jobs. And this will put a lot more pressure for younger generations because you will have to prove not only that you're better than your competitor, as we all did at one point when we're applying for a job, but you will also have to prove what value can you provide that a computer cannot provide. And that is a new challenge. That is definitely a new challenge. So in other words, you have to learn how to think. You have to prepare for the unexpected. And this again is something that previous generations have not had to face at the rate of change that you're facing today. Now, how to do this? Well, I would say step number one, ask yourself, what makes you special? What strengths do you have? How much time are you spending in thinking? How much energy do you invest in thinking? Not just absorbing information passively, but how carefully do you think things over? So in a way, we have to move faster now because of all of this new technology, but we also have to slow down, and that's the paradox. Technology moves faster, but I think humanity has to take, in some cases, a brief pause to think about what really matters. Not only to do, but to actually think, to actually reflect on what is happening around you, what are your life goals, where, where are we heading as a society? And where is the world heading as a planet? And all of those things are difficult and they will take practice. They will take mistakes. But making mistakes is okay as long as we learn from them. So the idea of a learning society is not new. But now we really are going to be experiencing what that means. Now, something else is that credentials degrees, certifications, they will become only initial stepping stones. Since information changes very quickly, as we said, jobs are changing and morphing, disappearing and being created again, it's gonna be more important that you can learn a new job on the spot, that you can teach yourself what we call lifelong learning or continuing education, it's going to be a lot more important than simply whether you have a certificate in something or you memorize the seven magical steps to do something else. And again, this is something different. You know, in the olden days, you started a career, you got your bachelor's, you closed the book, and you did the same thing for 40 years, and it was perfectly fine. I mean, it was not the ideal, but your generation definitely cannot do that. So now wrapping up what we have talked about today, 
youth are the key in adapting to this changing world, to the, the way that we process information. It is a very dangerous moment. It is a critical moment. Young people need to be more active mentally. They need to understand the limitations of technology. And finally, we need to recenter the human. Now, we cannot talk about artificial intelligence as if it were a being. And that's something that, that kind of really bothers me as a scholar. You know, when we talk about artificial intelligence, almost like he has a vote on the table. We need to remember that at the center, we always need to have the human and this is simply another part of technology. This is simply a tool. And yes, it's true. Technology changes us in a way. I mean, just think about cell phones, how in a way, you know, we shape our days and our lives in some cases around the cell phone, but we also have power over the cell phone, right? We're not going to let the cell phone or the computer control us. So this relationship has to be bidirectional. So we have to go back to basic principles of life. We need to learn how to reflect and we need to take control over our future. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I am more than oh. <laughs> Actually, uh, Ambassador Abbas, uh, listening carefully to what you were presenting, and you were presenting so many different aspects about humanity and the uh, interrelationship be between what's going on at the current world and the human situation and how being creatures of habits, it's very, very difficult for us to change and modify our perspective without carefully understanding and studying what is it that we want to know. <laughs> so <laughs> it was most interesting presentation. And we will now turn over to Susie, as our moderator, Susie Halleck, who is going to be asking you the questions that we have received. Thank you, Dr. Durbeck, and thank you so much, Ambassador. Such a relevant topic, so it was very interesting to listen to your presentation. And we have questions flooding in from the audience. So the first one is, what are the pros and cons of implementing tools like ChatGPT in the workplace? And are you concerned about AI replacing certain functions? You talked about how um, there are some limitations, but in the future, do you foresee um, you know, AI replacing some of the types of work that we do today? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and the answer is yes and no, uh, which is, I know, kind of confusing. Uh, but basically what's happening is this. It's the same thing that happened with, with secretaries, you know, who ended up becoming basically administrative assistants and administrative managers. The functions will be replaced. Whether the people are replaced or not depends on the people. And what I mean by that is that, of course, you're going to need people to step up to the plate and take on more complex functions, which is the same thing as happened before. Rather than having 10 people doing, for example, data entry, uh, or in some cases, simply answering the phone, now you can have fewer people doing more complex multitasking and managing basically the office. The same thing is starting to happen in many different industries. So it's up to the employee whether their job is going to be transformed, or you could say scaffolded to a higher level, or whether they're simply going to be replaced. So yes, that's the hard truth. How do you personally implement AI in your daily work and research? Oh, another good question. I am old school, ironically. Uh, I like to do things the old painful way. Uh, for example, when I do my research, I like to do it my way, you know, like I write it, I correct it 20 times. Uh, I feel that uh, artificial intelligence helps in some tasks like emails, for example, if it's answering a very basic email that does not take particular creativity and is definitely not going to earn me the Nobel Prize, uh, then something like that, I feel like, look, it's fair game, I can delegate that to the computer. But if it's something that has my, you know, my it's supposed to have part of my heart, you could say, and soul, then I like to do it from scratch. Makes sense. 
How did your experience working in Spain, Mexico, any other countries influence your understanding of international development issues and kind of prepare you for your roles today? Well, appropriate technology. You know, I feel like humans are humans and, and we are great at adapting to different challenges and problems. But at the end of the day, we all have great potential. And sometimes the problem is that we try to find universal solutions when solutions should always be local. I mean, we can definitely learn best, best practices and share them. But at the end of the day, each one of us, we understand our problems and we understand how we have to solve them. How are academic institutions amending their teaching approaches to adapt to this new wave of AI? You mentioned it's really quickly happening. So do you think we'll be able to adapt our academic approaches quickly enough to keep up? It's a huge challenge for universities and for schools. And one of the biggest changes is going from hypothetical deductive teaching, which is that you start with the answer and then you explain how you got to the answer to starting with the question. So it's a challenge for pedagogy, you know, and the way that courses are structured, whether it be in universities or schools, because for many years, we took a shortcut as teachers or professors. We started telling students, this is the learning objective, this is the answer, and this is how you get to that answer. But that makes us, number one, mentally lazy. And in many cases, the answer doesn't really matter as much. So now they have to come up with new uh, homework assignments, new final projects, new ways of evaluating students, rather than on the answer that they can obviously find in chat GPT, you know, and they're better at using it than their professors, then asking them, so what is the right question and why? Chat GPT cannot do that. How can we prepare ourselves to learn how to ask the right questions at the right time. Um, you mentioned changing our mindsets and um, there are definitely lots of ways, but are you aware of simple exercises that students can do to work on this part of their way of thinking? Uh, yeah, uh, well, the first of all, the first thing is, is identifying criteria. So you can have a concern, you start with a concern or an issue. And what we call scientifically variables, it could be the different criteria that you're looking for. And then you sit down and you try to word a question that can include those criteria in the question. I mean, of course, this is time consuming, but it's a way for you to mentally prepare, uh, prepare yourself to ask the right questions. If your final question does not include all the criteria that you consider important, then your answer obviously is not going to be satisfying. So that takes practice, that takes steps. And that's why I love when they include in lower school, in elementary school, you know, teaching the scientific method. That chapter is key. We're going to have to add extra lessons for that. You're a very confident and interesting speaker. So how are you ever... Uh, able to kind of get through presentations if you're afraid of speaking in public? Where, how did you kind of practice and develop this skill? Well, uh, I was very shy when I was actually in high school, surprisingly. I mean, I was not particularly charismatic. Uh, but then I got my first job very young as a professor. I got my master's and they just threw me with a class of 100 students. And it's weird, you know, all of a sudden I felt like, well, I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen to me? They're not going to throw tomatoes at me. I know what I'm talking about. And then practice and practice and practice and practice. And of course, if you understand what you're talking about, that gives you more confidence and it's going to make you a better speaker. But there's nothing like practice. And what do you consider to be the best form of education for today's youth? Are you more of a fan of learning by doing um, more lectures or kind of like a hybrid approach? Oh, that's a loaded question right there. Uh, well, I just wrote a book about that exact question. It's about progressive education versus traditional education, which is a big debate all over the world right now. And I think that it depends. It really depends. I mean, if you have some teachers who are great lecturers and they're very charismatic and their students love to listen to them, 
And there are others that they just put you to sleep. Uh, at the same time, just trying to do like uh, learning by doing, if it's not well planned, it can also be a disaster. So, so I think it should be a mix. You, if you teach something that is teaching a process, then of course you need to teach by doing, but you can teach history perfectly well uh, by giving a very good lecture. So I think that rather than continue with this debate about you know traditional versus progressive, let's take the best from both sides. That makes sense. When you were a kid, did you ever think that artificial intelligence would emerge and we'd kind of be having this discussion at this phase of your career? Well, I remember the movie Terminator. You know, I, I grew up in the 80s. And, and yes, you know, actually our generation was terrified about this. Uh, of course, it was more about robots trying to kill us and that type of thing. Uh, but yes, we definitely had the idea that this was going to happen. It was sadly, I would say that people had a very negative idea. We felt like technology was going to take away our autonomy. Maybe it was also because of the Cold War. I think it's a mix between having the Cold War, this technology, and feeling overwhelmed about all of the changes. So yes, I would say that I grew up with a very negative feeling that eventually I was going to be replaced by a robot. But I'm still here. <laughs> it it's known that there are some challenges that teachers have to work through with AI as well, like, like, you know, students potentially cheating or like going straight to ChatGPT for the answer. Um, have you kind of discussed ways to kind of mitigate those risks to ensure integrity in, in this classroom? Yes, I talk to university presidents uh, very often about this issue. Uh, and the best way to do it is the old school way of oral exams. You know, if you really go down to the basics, a teacher knows when the student knows. You know, it's it's very clear. You know, if you have an oral presentation and you question the student, then there is no way to cheat. So in a way, one thing that is being discussed is modifying assignments so that it truly shows what the student knows trying to cut the fat, as you would say, and by doing that, focusing on asking the right question and not so much checking to see if the student can simply find the right answer in chat GPT. Right, it kind of goes back to the creativity you mentioned, like how are, like kind of assessing their creative thinking and ways of coming to the answer. Mm -hmm. Um. So this question is interesting. Will AI disappear in the future? So I, I think where the audience member is getting at is sometimes we innovate so quickly as a society. And like you said, sometimes you have to take a step back. Do you think that the speed at which we're implementing it will kind of cause us to step away from AI at some point? It is already causing a backlash. You know, there are definitely concerns about privacy, uh, concerns about bias, because when we delegate part of our thinking process, it's a black box. You know, we don't know what sources were used by ChatGPT or by whatever. You know, there's a certain bias. It might not have the same criteria that we would have. So there is definitely some backlash. I mean, I don't think it's going to disappear. It's sort of like with calculators and many many other useful technologies. But definitely the level of centrality that it has right now in the media, I think that that will go away to a certain extent. Right now, there's a lot of fear. There is a rush for greater regulation, international debate about what to do with it, all of the security concerns. But I think that once the trend kind of like, people kind of like acknowledge that it's a new reality, and they learn to live with it, like with cell phones, the internet, and so on, then we can continue with our lives and let ChatGPT answer our emails. What inspired you to pursue such a diverse range of academic disciplines spanning from management to applied anthropology? And how have these experiences prepared you for what you do today? Well, I would say that feeling of not knowing. And then realizing that the more I know, the less I know. Uh, I feel that each discipline 
teaches you about part of reality. Reality, of course, is so complex that none of us can comprehend it. Uh, but I felt like sociology can teach me something, management can teach me something else, anthropology something else. I continue to study. And I feel like as human beings, lifelong learning is the key. That's what makes us humans. Basic knowledge in the field of social sciences and diplomacy is important for the awareness of for all people. So in your opinion, how much do you think the population can learn and acquire this education um, without going through formal, formal uh, processes and maybe tips for them to kind of um, learn, learn about these topics? Well, one of the biggest things in the diplomacy is only government to government. Uh, I think that what they call citizen diplomacy or third track diplomacy is as important or more important. We're all ambassadors in a way of our communities, of our schools, of our families, uh, and learning that you can talk to people with different cultures, different ideas, pretty much the communication skills that diplomats have, that is something that we can all try to acquire. And it's basically trying to see each other as humans, which means that we're complex creatures with different experiences, different backgrounds, but that we can have a dialogue to try to understand each other. Can you give an example of a very pressing or complex issue you've encountered in your work and how you approach to addressing the problem? Hmm. Well, one of the issues is equity in education. You know, access to higher education, that's uh, a problem that I've been thinking about for years. And the way I try to tackle it is to find partners, you know, like uh, to try to understand how the different different sectors of society, the public sector, governments, NGOs, uh, multinationals, how they can all work together to have a strong higher education sector that in a way is in their own interest. Because, you know, we have educated people, we have better citizens, and we have better workers, if you view it from an employer perspective, uh, and that is the challenge. So for me, the, the key in this is governance, and as a diplomat and a social scientist, how to connect the right people at the right moment has been the answer and the question at the same time for me in, in this problem that I've been facing. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing. How do you find balance and take care of your well-being while pursuing such a busy career? Hmm, lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I wake up very early. I try to exercise. They're both time for my family and, and love what I do. When you love what you do, then I guess your body can take more pain. <laughs> How do you think smart computers and robots can help teachers make studying more captivating for students in the new generation? That's, you know, the attention spans are so much shorter. Um, and like, the, I don't know how much we'll be able to kind of have them sit through longer, longer sessions. So do, are you aware of any practical or innovative tips that teachers are trying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that's a that's a fair question, and it's very useful for that, especially for K through twelve. Uh, there's no doubt that young people nowadays they they expect multimedia experiences. You know, we're competing against big concerts, you know, and video games and everything. So it's a challenge, you know, to keep them entertained so that they learn. So yes, gaming, the integration of gaming in the classroom, that is a great way to do it. Something else is self-guided learning that you might have the same classroom, but they're actually doing different things under the guidance of the instructor. And this works very well. One of the great advantages of AI, especially for K through 12, is that it can help answer certain questions at the moment that the student has them. And this is one of the, the things that I really like about AI in the classroom, because students have this magical moment especially like very, very young children. They want, they have all of these questions about everything, but they have them at the moment. If you wait two days, 
They forgot about the question, their feelings are gone and they don't care about it anymore. But if you can answer it at that moment, then learning happens. And also they develop a love for learning, which is even more important. So in that respect, definitely. I think that uh, teachers need more training, of course, to use this because it's not so easy in practice, but it can really help, especially in K through 12. Very interesting. Um, do you see challenges or obstacles in the way we're kind of developing society where there's both youth and older generations learning at the same time. It's it's an interesting way how you mentioned, it's just the, the pace is so much quicker. So you have less of the younger generation looking up to the older generation for the answer. It's almost, sometimes it's vice versa. So do you see kind of societal problems with this or do you see it as a more of a positive way of building kind of a two-way relationship? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of talk about generational differences and the conflict. Of course, the famous boomer thing. Uh, so, so yes, there's a lot of talk about that. But what I always tell both young people and elders is that we can all learn from each other. And especially, I, I used to teach at the master's level. And when you have master's students, they have some of them who are young, you know, they just finished their bachelor's. And you have some who are already successful business owners, you know, and they're already like in their 40s and 50s. And you have in the same classroom, you know, different generations completely learning at the same level. But something that happens is that that diversity of perspectives, you know, experience combined with this youthful energy that leads to greater dialogue. So I think that the key part is respect from both sides. Because it's true, young people have a lot to offer. They know a lot more about technologies and certain things than the elders. But the elders also know a lot. And part of those lessons can help those young people be even more successful than they already are. As the Deputy Permanent Observer to the UN for the International Youth Organization, what key initiatives or projects are you currently involved in or passionate about that help address youth-related issues on a global scale? Well, we organize uh, quite a few conferences, not only at the UN, but also all over the world. Uh, we just had one in Colombia and in Ecuador. And basically what we try to do is exactly what you were asking about before. We get leaders, for example, university presidents, you know, ministers of education, and we get young people and we basically put them in the same panel and we make them argue, we make them dialogue, we make them listen to each other. So our main effort is to give voice to youth, to try to get their ideas included in international public policy and of course in the different national policies. But in order to do this, we need to create those spaces for dialogue. So that is our main focus right now integrating youth into different academic and governmental conferences. Thank you. And do you see kind of the increase in technology and AI and education kind of helping increase diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, bringing academic resources to parts of the world that maybe it, it wasn't accessible before? Any interesting examples of this? Well, yes and no, like everything. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, AI has the potential to polarize education. So one line of research that I have right now is what effect that is going to have to in mainstream public schools. And one concern that I have personally is that it's going to hit the average student the hardest. You know, after the year 2000 in the US, we had a law called uh, No Child Left Behind where basically we started to invest more in the lowest 15%, you know, the students who are struggling. And what's gonna happen because of AI, when we restructure the curriculum, which is already happening, is that we're gonna be asking students not to write an essay about the life of George Washington, that they can ask GPT to do it, chat GPT to do it. We're gonna ask them to do things that require higher order thinking skills. So this is gonna put a lot more pressure on them and since we don't have legislation, and in some cases, the, the resources to support those students in that process of pushing them you know, harder than ever before, my fear is that many of them are gonna be left behind. So that could be actually a crisis in education. 
Now, if we answer this question at the international level, then we have the digital divide, which in this case, of course, this is just going to exacerbate the digital divide. We still have places that don't even have computers. I mean, as much as we sometimes don't, don't think about that, that some schools don't have the resources even to have access to the internet. And now we have this huge polarization that you're gonna have some schools already integrating all of these apps for artificial intelligence. And you're gonna have the other one still having to do everything with pencil and, and, and paper. Yes, that's a very interesting problem. Any sort of solutions that are being discussed at the moment or um, not yet? Well, uh, in terms of digital divide, we've been talking about this for decades, you know, as everything yeah. in the UN, you know, it's the same old problem, just different packaging, right? Uh, but I would say that the solution is that even if you don't have access to the technology, you do have access to your own mind and you can still restructure the teaching process. And I always give the example of Socrates, that if you were in a class in ancient Greece with one of those great philosophers, chat GPT would not help you at all. So if we take any of those pupils, they would be ready for the artificial intelligence revolution. Well, many people who have access to the best computers are not. So we can still help those people in the rest of the world changing their teaching processes with appropriate technology. This question is interesting because we already talked about kind of enhancing integrity or making sure that students aren't cheating and using ChatGPT. But on the flip side, what are the potential implications of AI-driven grading systems and automated feedback mechanisms for student assessment? How can educational institutions maintain transparency and fairness in evaluating student performance rather than kind of automatically using these solutions to quickly grade, grade their mm -hmm. assignments? Well, that depends on whether we're talking about formative assignments or summative. If it's something that is just a very short quiz, which is multiple choice, then obviously artificial intelligence can do it very well. And if someone wants to audit to see if little Bob you know, got it right or not, I mean, it's very easy nowadays to access those systems. But if we're talking about feedback for written assignments or master's thesis, or of course, doctoral dissertations, then we do need the human element. We cannot delegate the grading of a doctoral dissertation even to the most advanced artificial intelligence. So it's like everything else, it's like calculators. It depends on the moment. It depends on the situation. We just need to be transparent about who is grading what. And that is something that accreditation agencies already take into consideration in their auditing. Makes sense. Um, the point you made around teaching students how to ask the right questions, super interesting to me because I just took a training, I'm a consultant, and I took a training on leading with questions. And what they're saying is you used to go to a consultant or a company would bring in a consultant for the answers to their problems. But now given solutions are constantly changing, problems are constantly changing, um, that's less less needed, especially if you have ChatGPT where you can just Google the answer. Um, but now where our role comes in is kind of being more of that facilitator, having had the experience helping clients work through problems before and coming in and asking really the right questions to help the client come to the right answer themselves. Um, do you see that kind of shift in mindset also impacting other industries and the way you would think about going to a professional. It's more of having their guidance rather than coming to them and asking for the answer to your question. It reminds me of a coach. And this is something that is already happening in the private sector, that you hire a coach. You're the one who knows your organization. The coach is there to help you, to guide you in the process to help you formulate the right answers, but you're the one who has to play the game. So I think that that is going to affect all types of different industries. It's already even happening in medicine. It's interesting in medicine that it's uh, historically, 
is one of those disciplines that they they used to think that they were gods. You know, they had the answer uh, to everything, the absolute diagnosis. Uh, but if you look at the cutting edge literature in in medicine, they're starting to accept that in some cases there are many alternatives. That in some cases, not knowing exactly what is happening and telling the patient that you don't really know exactly what's happening is more ethical than trying to lie to them that there's only one solution. So I think that is the same thing, that your physician is gonna become kind of like a health coach in a way, and the same as consultants are becoming coaches. It's trying to scaffold people to find their own questions. You mentioned a point of how we're like hyper-connected um, and and students can kind of shape their own reality and kind of the danger of that without having the proper guidance. Um, and I once heard an interesting point that we are kind of the most interconnected, but the loneliest society as well. Do you kind of agree with that statement that we're kind of establishing all of these social dynamics, create creating things virtually, but if people aren't gathering together in person, um, you can still kind of run the risk of feeling very isolated, maybe not developing the right social skills. Like, do you see that being a problem? Uh, yes, definitely. All of this social media interaction, it emulates real relationships, but obviously it has key differences. And one thing is that we have lost the ability to truly engage in conversation. Because a dialogue means that you're co-constructing knowledge. It means that you're actually listening and taking some points from the other person and integrating them into this reality that you're constructing together. But if you actually do some discursive analysis of blogs, you know, or discussion boards, people really talk past each other. It's more like you're broadcasting. That would be a better way to view it. So yes, that this is definitely a challenge. It's nothing new because it started, of course, with the internet, that idea that people are more alienated than ever before. But my hope is that artificial intelligence will actually free up some of our time to have more meaningful interactions. We can leave the very mechanical part to the computer and we can focus on emotions again, reflection, introspection way to look at it. Um, and do you see any interesting programs shaping up that will help develop our youth leadership skills, given now that we mentioned that the role as a, an advisor can change, but also as a leader, you don't go to the leader for all the answers anymore in this new world. So are there ways to kind of develop our youth leadership qualities so that they can be the type of leader that's needed in an AI type of environment. Yeah, one of the great things about these new technologies is especially the customized AI systems. Uh, basically, you can feed a bunch of case scenarios and help coach or simulate different leadership uh, problems with young people without, of course, the possibility of making a huge mistake in a real organization. So you could view it as a pre-internship without many of the risks. But then again, that never, it can never be the same thing as a real internship or, or, or as a real in human interaction. So all of this will only be a tool. It's sort of simulators for pilots. You can practice with artificial intelligence or for example, when they used to train military generals with, with those strategy games, but it's never the same thing as the real battlefield. And as you look to the future, what excites you the most or gives you the most hope um, in, in the area of academics, AI, or in general? Well, uh, for me, I just feel that it's such an exciting time to be young. Uh, I mean, I feel young mentally sometimes, <laughs> but I just feel that being young is kind of like a state of mind. And young people now have so many possibilities to develop certain abilities that for a long time, they were kind of obscured 
by more basic functions that now people will create their own jobs in a way, you know, even their education is customized to a whole other level. And education is changing so quickly that it's kind of like a menu. It's like you're going to get your bachelor's in your own unique needs. And that is, for me, a very exciting because it's the highest level of differentiation. It's truly trying to help each person achieve their own maximum potential. And I feel like that in the long term is going to have a huge effect in productivity and is going to raise our existence as humans to a whole other level. Inspiring. Thank you. I'll turn to Dr. Durbeck if you have any remaining questions and would like to close out. Thank you, Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, I was very interested in a couple of things that you were talking about. One thing, the, the people are creatures of habit and it's very difficult to understand what really are their motivations unless you are prepared to be able to spend an awful lot of time understanding and teaching them how to ask the right questions so that you can give them the correct answers. I was also, but partly because I worked with all sorts of emotional problems with juvenile delinquents, so I knew how difficult it was to get them to respond and get to where they were supposed to go. But uh, our, one of our speakers was talking about using the digital platforms, a low bandwidth AI technology uh, for um, improving the um, relationships using the AI technology and the mother tongue factors in order to be able to bring them up to par so that they can communicate uh, wor worldwide. So have you done any work with that? And uh, do you think that that might be a way to implement uh, educational technology and educational, uh, particularly uh, the understanding of why people do not learn and understand um, in in the future? Well, I personally have not focused on special education uh, uh, and ELL, which is for, for people with English as a different language, but my colleagues have. Uh, and from what I've heard, these uh, different applications have a huge potential to help uh, bring up to the same level, you could say, or scaffold people who have either disabilities or simply the issue of language barriers, so in that respect, for, uh, for them, this is a way to fulfill their maximum potential and to integrate them, you could say, in the workplace, school, uh, or many other ways. Uh, it can also help in mental health, which is uh, a big issue in education right now. Uh, as you could say, improving communication, teaching communication skills through that. But again, it depends on the situation. You have to teach the person who is going to train the person who is going to use this for therapy or for training. So I think that we should be careful to jump on this bandwagon because as someone who has trained teachers for many years, there is always resistance to change. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to train the trainer. And then these are new technologies, so we haven't really evaluated their effect yet. So I think that we should take it slowly uh, and to test it in some particular environments. Well, thank you. It's very interesting to be able to explore different perspectives and different um, approaches to using the AI. Uh, and since we do have a great deal of problem in the parts of the world that because of the lack of um, communication skills due to the lack of technology, how to incorporate them in order to be able to uh, make the world more, how should I put it, uh, more functioning. <laughs> because at the present time, it uh, seems to me that we are in a period of dysfunction, which could uh, lead either to greater tragedies or maybe using technologies in order to prevent the tragedies and um, 
build uh, the world that, for example, the United Nations has been trying to do since its inception. So thank you very, very much for a very interesting presentation. And we wish you the best of luck in all of your endeavors. And uh, Susie, thank you very much. And uh, have a good week and goodbye. Thank you so much for your attention. Take care, everyone.